was a beautiful, beautiful day on the Sea of Galilee. Not a cloud in the sky. It was spring, so the weather was cool but not too cool. Warm but not too warm. And Jesus had just finished preaching and teaching in a home. And, and he's facing a lot of opposition. So he leaves the house and he goes down this, this short path down to the Sea of Galilee. And this great crowd of people are following him, right? Of course, you have the religious leaders who are just waiting and hoping he says something so they can crucify him. He has, of course, his own family. They're there. And just earlier on, they heard this message where, where, where someone said, hey, Jesus, your mother and father are outside. And Jesus says, my mother and father are anyone who do the will of God. So they're coming to the sea and their hearts are heavy. And of course, there were men and women there, people who have been healed by Jesus, and they're excited. They want to hear more from this guy. Other people wanting just to touch him, wanting just to get near him, so they too maybe will be healed. And of course, they were just your typical folks who are just there for the show, right? Come on, Jesus, show off. Let's see some. This has been fun. And other people who really didn't really care what he said or what he did, they just were part of the crowd. And still other people who were just desperate, desperate, going, man, Jesus, we want to hear more from you. And so Jesus quietly goes down to the lake and this crowd just continues to push him and push him um, from the shore. And so he gets in to a boat and he tells, of course, the person who owns the boat, or maybe it was one of his disciples, hey, let's just go out just a little way, just enough so I can get away from the crowd, just enough so I can use the, uh, 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 the water to kind of amplify my voice because now I'm going to teach again, but this teaching is going to look very, very different. And so Jesus gets in this simple boat, not a big boat, not a small boat, but a simple boat. They push off from the shore, not too far away, but close enough. The crowd gathers down to a rocky beach, much like that. And Jesus sits down and he begins to teach them. But this time, it's something unlike they've ever heard from them. This is so radically different than the Sermon on the Mount. This is just a simple story, a simple illustration, a, a proverb even, if you will, of something that they would all get, they would all understand. But what we're going to see is many of them won't get it. Many of them won't understand it. And when he gets there, he sits down and he begins to teach. And this is what he says. He said, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as we were scattering the sea, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. And some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. And the sun came up, and the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. And other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred and sixty or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And then he's going to do a little teaching, and then he's going to meet with his disciples privately later, and they come to Jesus and they say, man, what was that all about? Right? We're, like, what was that all about? Look with me at verse 18. He says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one, the devil, comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart? This is the seed sown among the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they fall quickly away. And the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness Seafulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred or sixty times that which is sown. Now, we need to ask ourselves, what in the world is going on here? Like, what is Jesus trying to do? Is he trying to be cute? Is he trying to be some storyteller? And what we understand from this parable, we're going to hear seven other parables all together, is that he's starting to prepare his disciples for how his mission will continue and how his kingdom will advance after he's taken away and executed. The pressure is coming. And so Jesus is speaking now in parables to help them understand why there is such a dramatic response to his message about the kingdom of God. And so here's the key question in this passage. The key question is this. Does the fault lie in the message 
or in those who receive it? Like, is the problem with the message of the kingdom of God itself, or is the problem inside of each one of our own hearts? And so he tells this story. Hey, some seed fell on the path, quickly eaten by birds. Now you need to know that in that day, this was an ancient farming technique that we don't really use today, right? They would scatter seed all over the place, and then they would till the soil, hoping that most of it would grow. And so they got that. They would understand that which the seed would fall on the path. That would be the path that the farmer would use to get onto his field. And he says some seed fell on rocky soil where it quickly withered. If you go around Israel and Palestine, I've been there last year, like it's very rough, very rocky. It's not like the Salinas Valley, you guys, okay? And then he says some seed fell among thorns and it was choked out and some seed fell on good soil that produced a huge crop. Now you need to understand what Jesus is saying here is almost, a, is almost ridiculous. The average crop in Palestine in those days, according to most scholars, yielded about seven to ten times what was sown. So for Jesus to say that this crop yielded a hundred or sixty or even thirty was just an outrageous yield. It was like, wow, really? And so what Jesus begins to do is he explains this parable privately to his disciples. He tells them exactly what It means, he says, hey guys, the seed is the message about the kingdom. We would say today it's the word of God, or we would say it's the gospel, the life-changing message of the death and life of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, I've been asking myself, why does God, why does Jesus compare God's word to seed? And I think it's because the word, like seed, is living and powerful because the kingdom of God, just like a small mustard seed, can grow into something enormous. That unlike other words from other religious figures, from other rabbis, the words of God have, has life in them. And that life can be given to those who receive it in faith. So that's the seed. And then Jesus actually doesn't tell us who the farmer is. Did anyone notice that? He doesn't tell us. Now, we all assume that it's God, and I think it's God, but we actually are not told, and I think that's important. I'll make that point at the end. And then the soil, Jesus tells us, really represents our hearts and our response to the word. And so on this Palm Sunday, as we head into the Easter week, really what this passage is teaching us is this. Your reception, my reception to the word of God is really determined by the condition of our hearts. Our reception to God's word, to the gospel, to the good news is really determined by the condition of what's going on in here. And so Jesus tells us there's four types of soils, four types and different conditions of our hearts. Let's look at each one of these. The first is the hard heart, the hard heart. And so the seed that fell on the path are those whom the seed is quickly, boom, snatched away by the evil one, the devil. And the seed never takes root. It never gets below the surface. So the devil comes away and takes away what's been planted in our hearts. And now it's not that these people don't intellectually understand the word. The problem is they do nothing with it, right? Listen to James chapter 1. It says, do not merely listen to the word. And so deceive yourselves, finish it with me, do what it says. So don't just listen to the word, do what it says. And the irony in this passage and all over the book of Matthew is what we've seen is time and time again is the religious people. Those were the ones, the people who should have got it were the ones who were most hardened to the message of Jesus. But... What we see here is the good news is that God gives everyone a chance to hear and respond. You notice how the seed was just scattered everywhere, right? And so the hope is that the hard heart doesn't have to stay that way. Man, in all my years as a pastor, I see hard hearts, right? I've seen it in my own life. And what I've learned from people is that the hard heart takes careful and deep plowing by the farmer. Sometimes a hard heart takes years for um, for the gospel to break through. And this is good news because maybe, man, you have a rebellious child who just refuses to hear anything about Jesus. He or she has a hard heart and it breaks your heart. Or maybe you have a spouse who only puts up with your church attendance for the sake of relational peace. 
Or maybe you have a neighbor or a coworker, man, you would just love to see them embrace faith in Jesus. But every time you bring up the J word, it's like, uh-uh, I don't want to hear it, Right? The truth of this passage is that there's hope, that the seed gets scattered everywhere. And so Jesus is telling us, keep sowing, keep watering, keep praying, keep tilling that hard soil because a hard heart doesn't have to stay that way. Thank you. I was waiting for that, Juan. Thank you. I love that. It's good. (laughs) And then the second soil is the shallow heart. And that's the seed that fell on rocky soil are those who Jesus tells us that, man, they receive it immediately with joy. Like they're so excited about Jesus. But guess what happens? Life shows up. Anyone have some life show up this week? Yeah, 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 me too. Yeah. And life shows up and their faith is tested and persecution comes. And all of a sudden they're like, whoa, whoa, what happened? And maybe they start coming to church or coming to Jesus because maybe they feel like, you know, Jesus will be a quick fix to my marriage. Maybe this Jesus guy will deliver me from this struggle that I've just been dealing with that no one can help me with. Maybe Jesus will help me get out of debt or make me rich or whatever. (laughs) Come on, Lord, you can do it. (laughs) Uh, You have not because you ask not. That's right. That's what he says. That's right. Oh, man. See, you throw me off now. Where am I? Let's, Let's go to lunch. It's 12. (laughs) <laughs> but honestly, right, sometimes the church is at fault for this. We do this all the time. Hey, just pray a prayer, ask Jesus in your heart. That's all you need to do. You got the fire insurance. And then a month or a year goes by and becomes clear, and we wonder, gosh, did they ever really truly embrace Jesus? Now, we know this line, right? It doesn't matter how you start the race. It's how you what? Finish. And that's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying that the shallow heart has little depth. The roots of faith can't go down very deep. And so when things get hard, when the times of testing come, their faith withers. The word literally means fall away. It literally in the Greek means they get tripped up. Tripped up by the pressures of life. Tripped up by this pressure to live for Christ, right? Reading the Bible just seems too hard. Going to church regularly, that's like ridiculous. Who has time for that? Joining a Bible study, impossible. Praying, yeah, these folks will pray only when it's hard and difficult. They get tripped up by the pressures and trials of life. George Whitfield, an amazing and passionate and powerful preacher of the first great awakening he used to preach you guys to crowds of thousands of people and he was like Billy Graham long before there was Billy Graham and thousands would respond to his message and he would always he was always asked man how many people came to faith tonight how many people did you save what was the response like and he always answered we'll see in a few years wow we'll see in a few years now the point is not that people earn their salvation the truth is it takes time for true salvation to be demonstrated. All right, the second heart, and this is a heart I think we can all understand and and we're all dealing with. I call it the cluttered heart, the cluttered heart. See, the seed that fell among the thorns are those who just get distracted. We get distracted by the worries of life. We get distracted by the pursuit of wealth. And this soil of this person's heart, it's actually good, but it suddenly gets cluttered with nasty thorns. And I love that Jesus uses thorns because thorns is a perfect illustration of a cluttered heart, right? Thorns don't just grow overnight. Thorns slowly and quietly kind of grow alongside the plant until it starts choking the plant. And soon before you know it, the plant begins to die. And man, it's amazing that Jesus said this so long ago because how relevant is this? to us living in America today. See, on the outside, the person with a cluttered heart, they were probably once walking with God, even closely with God, but over time, the word got choked out. Choked out by what? Jesus tells us, choked out by the worries of life. Anyone have anything they're worried about this morning? Be honest, right? A few things. If you didn't raise your hand, we want to talk to you. Help us figure this out. The word gets choked out by distractions. Right? It's so easy to be distracted on the field. Oh, there's a new 5K in San Francisco. And oh, let's go to that festival. And oh, you know, like my kid plays um, competitive basketball. We're always distracted on Sundays. It's hard. Or maybe you're distracted by your house remodel or a new hobby or you're expanding your biz. So easy to get distracted. The word gets 
choked out by busyness. Oh man, right? We know this. I don't have to say this, right? You, how you doing? Busy. Oh my gosh, so busy. Oh man, busy. How about you? Busy. We're all busy. And it's like a badge of honor. Man, how busy are you? Tell me. Woo, you're busier than me. Wow. Right? It's like a badge of honor, you know? It's like, and I love when you guys come talk to me. Oh, Rob, I really want to talk to you, but I know you're so busy. And sometimes I'm like, not all the time, you guys. Actually, like, like, like I'm like, you know? And this happens in my life, right? We say things like, you know what, man, when, when things settle down, you know, I'll get back to spiritual things. Hey, pastor, God knows that I work hard and I need some me time. Hey, hey, you know what? Once we get past this season of life, because it's just crazy, we'll, we'll make the Lord a priority again. And then finally, Jesus says that the word gets choked out by deceitfulness of wealth. Literally, if you look in the original language, that word literally means the pleasures of wealth. Yeah. And so it's not that wealth is bad. It's not even that pleasure is bad. But it's the pursuit of it. And if we're not careful, it can bring all kinds of problems. I was at a lunch for pastors this week, and there was a, a guy who's like some big wig investment guy in the, in, in the Silicon Valley. And he, he made a statement. I was like, that can't be true. And he said that the average Silicon Valley entrepreneur and tech worker puts in anywhere from 70 to 100 hours a week. And I'm like, that's not sustainable. And we know people, and by the way, if we live in America, we're all wealthy, just FYI, but we know people that have lots of wealth, and and it's amazing, and there's lots of opportunities to travel and do amazing things, and, but gosh, those things can easily and quickly choke out the word. It's not that those things are wrong. It's that Jesus is saying they quickly and subtly choke out the word. And then finally, Jesus tells us about this fruitful heart, right? This is the the heart we all want, right? Right? If I, you know, this is the heart, like, oh, that's me for sure, me, you, right, me, right? Yeah, right? That's a, 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 all the other hearts, that's everyone else, but this one's me, this one's for sure. <laughs> but this is a seed that falls on good soil. These are people, listen, they hear the word, they receive the word, and Jesus says they actually bear a crop. Jesus is saying here, actually, that a very small few hear the word and accept the word. And produce a fruit. He's actually preparing the disciples. He's saying, hey, not everyone is going to listen to you guys. Right? Look at what they're doing to me. And, and I want you to notice that there's nothing like flashy going on here. It's not like the plants growing, hey, look at me. It's like this like slow and quiet and steady growth in the life of a follower of Jesus. Do you know that maturity takes time? Did you know that? Do you know that it's hard work? Right? Do you know that disciples are not born, they're made, right? And it's so weird. I want to go on a tangent here. It's so weird. Like we go to the gym and we look at everyone and we go, man, we know it takes hard work to get back in shape. But then we look at our spiritual lives and we think like just through osmosis, it's going to happen, you know? Like God knows he's just going to do a work in my life and I'm just going to be super obedient and in the word. And I'm like, it's discipline, right? It's hard even for me. And so Jesus says here that, that this seed begins to develop and mature and there's this bumper crop and it looks different from every person. Some of you all, man, you're producing a huge crop of 100 times. Some of you, you're definitely more like 60 times people, right? And over here, you're like the 30 times. No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting how he separates that, right? And I was thinking about it's kind of like a coach or a, or a teacher, A coach can only do so much. A teacher can only do so much, right? A coach can help you get better. But you know what a a coach can't do? They can't play the game for you. A piano teacher can only teach you so much. But if you're not practicing, your recital is going to be awful, right? Right? And that's kind of what Jesus is saying here. Hey, you want to produce fruit? You want to be, hey, we want to have that good, tender heart soil? Then you got to practice it. Like, follow me here. Let me make sure if this makes sense, right? You only become generous by what? Being generous. You only know the word better by studying it and reading it, right? You only become a servant by serving others. You only become a person of prayer by doing what? Praying. And you only grow in community by being in community, And so as we practice what I call the way of Jesus, the more we mature and grow, what happens is our hearts become more fruitful. And man, and you just see the evidence of that. 
And so this passage just begs the question, what kind of soil are you? I know we all want to be the fruitful soil, but let's be honest. What kind of soil are you? Is your heart unreceptive to God's word? Is your heart shallow? Is your heart just preoccupied by and busy with all the stuff going on? Or are you hearing the word, receiving the word, and then doing what it says? Okay, I'm going to pause right here. Remember all that because in Jesus, and I skipped this passage because I'm coming back to it. Now look with me at verses 10 through 17 because in the middle of the parable, there's this explanation of why he's teaching in parables and then, and then he explains the parable. We've done the two bookends. Let's look at the middle section because I think it's important. Um, the disciples come to him and ask, hey, Jesus, why do you speak to people in parables? I'm in verse 10. And he replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom have, of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. So you'll be given to the disciples, but not to the crowd. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from, from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. And now he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 6. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become what? Callous. Say that again. These people's heart has become what? Callous. Do you know how easy it is for your heart to become callous? They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn. I would do what to them? Say it with me. I will heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see. He's talking to the disciples, but did not see it and hear what you hear, but did not see hear it. Jesus is essentially saying, hey guys, I'm talking to people now in parables because the cross is coming. In verse 11, he says, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. What he's saying here is he's using that word secret. It actually comes from the Greek word mysterion, where we get the English word mystery. It's the only place used here in the gospels. The Apostle Paul picked up on this idea. If you read through his epistles, his letters, he loved to talk about the mystery of the gospel. And what he does and what Jesus is doing here is essentially saying that God's truth, the kingdom of God, can only come through revelation by God and not by natural human insight. It's a secret. And the secret is that the kingdom of God has drawn near to them in Jesus Christ. The disciples are starting to get it. Most don't get it and don't understand. There are some who receive it and many who reject it. And then Jesus backs this up by quoting from Isaiah chapter 6. And he's using the Isaiah passage to explain to them why the crowds do not respond to the king or to his kingdom. He's saying it's always been this way, you guys. He's saying in those verses and in the book of Isaiah as a whole, what you see there is Israel's fail, failure to respond to the prophet's message. In fact, it's very interesting. If you read Isaiah chapter 6, God calls Isaiah to go preach to Israel. And he tells them, and just so you know, they are not going to respond to you. They are going to reject you and your message. Wow. Incredible. And now Jesus is saying that he's the greater prophet. And even Jesus, like Isaiah, is meeting the same type of unresponsiveness in those who hear. And so Jesus says, it's time for me to now teach them in parables. Because those who God is truly working on, who are spiritual people, who who have eyes to see, who are hungry for the gospel, they're going to hear. They're going to understand. But the rest, they're going to reject me anyway, no matter what I say, no matter what I do. Look what's already been happening. And so the blame is not on Jesus. The blame is not on his message. The blame, as he's told us, is on us, on our hard, shallow, and divided hearts. And it's no different today. Well, in almost every sermon you've ever heard on this passage, you've grew up in church, you've heard about 250 of them. 
the preacher or the teacher did exactly what I just did. Some better, some worse. Up to you to decide. But I want to step back and show you a completely different perspective in this parable. Really, this parable should be called the parable of the soils. My Bible calls it the parable of the sower. And I want to look at the perspective of the sower, the perspective of the farmer. I want you to notice again that all get the same seed. All hearts, whether they're hard or soft, hear the same word from God, but only a few receive it. Matter of fact, for those of you who love math, just consider the math of this parable. 75% reject the seed, which means 25% receive the seed, and it falls on good soil and take roots. Okay, baseball season is coming. Thank you, Jesus. But if you're batting one for four, you have a batting average of what? 250, and if the entire season goes that way, you'll be cut from the Giants and you'll be paying, playing for the Pensacola Blue Wahoos or the Midland Rockhounds or some other random team like that. Look it up, they're hilarious. <laughs> it's like not good, right? To bat 250. But again, I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't tell us who the sower is. Yes, in one sense, it's God, but in another sense, you're the sower. In another sense, you and I are the ones who plant seeds. Listen to what Apostle Paul said about this in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. He said, I planted the seed. Apollos, who was another teacher at about the time, watered it, but God has been making it grow. Who planted the seed? Paul. Yes, not a trick question. Paul, right? <laughs> and so the question is, like, think about it. If 75% of people reject the seed today, what in the world does a 25 represent? And why do we keep sowing seed? If we're gonna it's gonna be rejected 75% of the time, I think the 25% uh, percent represents change lives. And church is getting so much trouble over this because it's so much easier to, do no, to, to sow no seed it's so much easier just to do a very little. But what Jesus is telling us here, it's worth it to sow lots of seed. And actually, if we're going to sow seed, we need to sow lots of it. Because if my math is correct, the more we sow, the more we what? The more we reap, right? And the reaping is worth it because that 25% represents changed lives. Have you ever seen a changed life? Life a life that was broken and God put together back again, like my old friend used to say, like Humpty Dumpty, right? I think of a guy named Rob in our church, not this Rob, another great looking guy named Rob. And uh, <laughs> I'm joking, if you don't know me, I'm just joking. Uh, but this guy, Rob, it's a fascinating story. He started coming with his fiance several months ago because they both sensed just a, a deep longing uh, on the inside. They were both empty and wondering if there was a God and who was he. And, and at one point during one of our services, at some point in time, he couldn't really put his finger on it. He stepped over that line of faith. He raised his hand. He embraced Jesus. And all of a sudden, things started to change. As I met with him, he told me that he came from a Unitarian Universalist kind of background. Never been to church before. And so we grabbed coffee because that's what pastors do. And, uh, and, and, and he wanted to meet with me because he had a question about communion. And I thought he was going to be mad at how we do communion. And he's like, I don't like the gluten-free crap. I don't know what he was going to do. But as we talked, he said, Rob, explain communion to me. And I said, well, what do you mean? What's going on there? I went, oh, you've never taken communion. He's like, I've, no, I don't feel like we're, we're worthy to take communion. I don't understand what's happening there. So I was like, oh, okay. So my guard came down, and, and, and I started to explain to him how we Protestants view communion as opposed to Catholics and what it means. And, and because you are feel unworthy, you should definitely come to the table. It's, we all feel unworthy, and we had this great talk. And, and then they came to church the next week, and we had communion. And, and I was kind of watching if he was going to take it, and they took it. So afterward, I, I, if I remember right, I went up to him and said, hey, hey, how is it like? And... Him and his fiance began to describe this overwhelming experience they had with God through taking communion. How God just met them in this unique, real way where he just loved on them. And, 
And he said, I was just overcome with emotions as he took the bread and drank from the cup. And here my heart heart was like, really? Like, you know, I was thinking like, I was like, just so you know, it doesn't always happen that way, Rob. Like, wow, you know. (laughs) But I was just blown away and I realized, oh man, this is what it's all about. And now he's going to get baptized on Easter. That's a changed life, you guys. That is 25. Yes, we can clap about that. I think of a woman named Tammy. Tammy and her husband, her then husband and kids started coming to our church a while ago. And it wasn't long after Tammy's husband just suddenly left her and she found herself alone raising her kids by herself. And she's had some high highs, some low lows. By the way, I got all the permissions to share this. God has been this very real presence in her time of pain and heartbreak and trial She told me just recently, she said, Rob, I wouldn't even know what I'd do if it wasn't for Jesus and this church. I am definitely not the same woman I used to be before I walked in here. I'm even raising my kids differently. She said they start crying when they find out in the morning that it's not Sunday. (laughs) And I see this woman almost every single Sunday. Her kids come running into church. Man, she is growing. She's producing fruit. That, you guys, is a change. life. That's the 25%. So here's the deal. If we're going to be serious as a church about our mission to make and mature more followers of Christ, if we truly are serious about our vision to be this authentic community of Jesus followers who love and serve people, we have to sow lots more seeds. Again, just consider the math, you guys. So 100 seeds, how many is going to bear fruit? 25. Thank you, engineers. So 1,000, how many is going to bear fruit? 250, right? The more we sow, the more we reap, and the more we reap, the more lives are transformed. But sowing, man, is both our work and God's work. It's hard. It takes resources. It takes an investment of time and energy. It's not always fun. It gets messy, and it takes, it can be tiring. Just think about where we live, okay? For those of us who live in San Mateo County, I'm not, I'm going to take out the city right now, but just look at San Mateo County. There's roughly 720,000 people, more or less. All the people living in garages, they don't count, okay? Um, which is lots of us, <laughs> Right, and, and, and about, the best we can tell is about 25,000 attend an evangelical Bible-believing and teaching church. That's only about 3.4%. 3.4%. Now compare that to California, where, where 9.4%. Right, go to church, mostly in Southern California, Orange County. Yeah, we're all jealous. And the national average of 16.2%. This is hard soil, in case you don't know it. The cost of living, the pace of life, the culture, and all the other things we whine and complain about on Facebook makes this hard to do kingdom work here. Seminarians graduate and and their Bay Area is not on their radar. It's not, right? They don't get us and don't understand us and look on um, Craigslist and freak out, right? So how do we change that? Jesus tells us right here, sow more seed, How do we sow more seed? Again, it's not rocket science. We sow more seed by serving others. Man, if you're not serving in a ministry, jump in. There's all kinds of opportunities we have for you to use your time, your talents right here. And many hundreds of you are doing that. Thank you so much. We sow by giving, right? Now, thankfully, we've done a great job financially this year in this area, but I know we can do better. If you're like me, you just did your taxes, hopefully. Some of y'all are late. I get that, right? And even as I evaluated my W-2 and evaluated my giving, even I thought, man, we can do better in this area. And so look at your giving. Are you satisfied with it? We can sow by praying. Pray for us. Pray for our staff. Pray for the Bay Area. Pray for our impact. Pray for our protection. How often do you pray for our church? We can sow, finally, by scattering seed. Right now where you're sitting, take up that little flyer and just flap it up to me. Show me that flyer, because I don't have one. 
Everyone. Okay? You know what you're holding right there? It's a seed. You're holding a seed. Don't plant it because nothing will grow. Okay? But uh, you're holding a seed. God has planted you where you work, where you go to school, in your neighborhood. You have extended family, right? Use that as a seed. And here's the deal. You're here, follow me, this is so important. You're here today because someone planted a seed in your life. Do you know most Christians, most Christians will never leave, lead anyone to the Lord in their lifetime. And so what I wanna say, if you wanna invite your neighbor to church, invite them to your home first, have dinner with them, and then invite them to church, okay? So Easter is next weekend, this weekend, Let's sow seed, you guys. Let's sow seed. So serve, give, pray, sow. Why? Because change lives are worth it. Amen? All right, let's pray together as though Josiah comes back out. And so, Father, we're thankful this morning for who you are and what you're doing in and through our church. As I look around this auditorium, there's lots of people who someone sowed a seed in. And they invited and they encouraged and they prayed and they kept pestering and they're here because of what you're doing in their life and what that one person or that one gal or that one family member. And so Father, would we be a church that cares about lost and hurting and broken people? Would we be a church where we're constantly sowing seed? We're trying out things that fail, but at least we're scattering seed. Help us, God, to use this opportunity that you've given us to be alive, to sow more seed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.